Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh Bismillahi wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah Today we have with us Sheikh and Professor An-Najjar Sheikh, I would like to begin with asking you the question of What is your most memorable moment in giving da'wah? That moment that sticks in your head You know, that you can't forget I begin by praising Allah or glory be to him And by seeking his blessings and mercy To be with Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him And by greeting you and our yours in our Islamic way. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. May Allah's peace, blessings and mercy be with you all. Allah, there are many uh, memorable uh, in uh, invited for da'wah. And uh, before I answer this question, I would like to emphasize the fact that the greatest support, moral support to a Muslim living amidst non-Muslims is to give da'wah. Allah, and this can make you feel stronger than you could ever be and um, closer to Allah as you can never be. So I recall um, when I went to the uh, United States of America in, in the middle 70s, I had a sabbatical leave and I started at UCLA as a visiting professor and immediately as I arrived at UCLA, at UCLA or at Los Angeles, I was told that uh, a trialogue between Islam, Christianity, and Judaism was planned many years ago. And the speaker about Islam left the content completely, and uh, they have nobody to stand for this except me. And I immediately refused. I said, this is uh, nonsense. How could you expect me to come out of the blue and uh, participate in a trialogue? I know nothing about it. This was to the Islamic Center in, in Los Angeles. A few moments later, I received a telephone call. I was still in hotel. I was even a uh, resident yet. Yeah. A telephone call from a man with the name of Dr. Gross, George Gross. He used to be a professor of comparative religion at UCLA, and he's a priest. And he said the announcement was that this is a prayer log. If a non-Muslim, if a Muslim does not show, nobody will come to the to, to the trialogue. It will be a failure. And he said, please come and just answer the questions that are going to be raised about Islam. We don't expect you to give a speech. And he kept on pressurizing me that I should go. I, I said, okay, I will come. It was Ramadan, and we were fasting. It was hot. Los Angeles was very hot. We broke our, our fast in the car going to this uh, trialogue. And uh, at the main door of the university, I found the Christians distributing their lecture or their talk, and the Jews also in nice printing, and there was nothing for the Muslims. And uh, somebody from the Islamic Center in Los Angeles introduced me to George Gross, and George Gross introduced me to a rabbi called Harold Schulweis, and uh, he told me that we speak in our historical order. So the Jews will speak first, then the Christian, and finally the Muslim. And I was relieved, at least, to give me the chance that, what are they talking about? As we were walking in to the stage, the rabbi uh, went on the extreme left and sat down. So George Gross told me uh, the order has been changed because we are alive in front of the cameras. I can ask him to leave his place. So you will start first. I had a, a very depressing moment, really. What, what could I do? I don't know what was the theme even of the conference. But uh, we sat down. They started uh, singing for Jesus Christ. There was a huge crowd, really, uh, thousands of people. And I started to think what would be the most suitable theme to a conference like this. And Allah gave me the insight that the authenticity of the glorious Quran and the non-authenticity of the Old Testament and the New Testament would be a good theme. So I started talking about this, how authentic the Quran is, 
how was it preserved in its original language, the Arabic language, word to word and letter to letter, uh, and how the other books have been sorted. And I told them clearly that Allah, who sent down the books of Abraham, who sent down the Torah to Moses, the Psalms of David, and the Bible to Jesus Christ, did not send down a book called Old Testament or New Testament. This is a human innovation that has nothing to do with the divine revelation, although it speak about the divine revelation. And there is a great deal of difference between the divine word and the human word. Every one of us had 20 minutes to talk. I fulfilled my 20 minutes, and then the stage went to Jordi Gross in the middle. He could not complete eight minutes. And then it went on, the mic went on to Harold Chervais, he started making joke, jokes to the audience. He said, my uh, Muslim friend said that the uh, Torah has been lost and we have innovated in the Talmud and in the Testament. And this is true. He said the Torah used to forbid usury and we have allowed usury and we became the rulers of money all over the world. And he kept on saying many of these completely wrong statements. And uh, he said, uh, my Muslim colleague said that Judaism is a closed religion. It does not accept anybody from outside the Jewish families, especially do not consider a Jew except someone whose, whose mother is a Jew. So he said that this is true because God is only God of Israel. So the crowd, which was dominantly Christian, started shouting at him and shaking and jerking their, their uh, chairs. And he tried to correct his, this mistake by saying, it doesn't matter, he can also care for others. And they started laughing at him. And he did not complete 12 minutes. And then uh, they said, there is a break, uh, have tea, coffee, and uh, some soft drinks, and some cakes and biscuits. Wallahi, I found the stage surrounded by a huge crowd. They told me, stay as you are. We have many questions to ask you. Just tell us what you want, we'll bring you tea, coffee, anything you want. And at this moment, wallahi, if I had 1,000 copies of the translations of the meaning of the glorious Quran, it could have changed that audience completely. And uh, after that, the crowd came to their sittings, and uh, for um, a couple of hours, no question was raised to the Jew or the Christian. All the questions were about Islam, because people are really key and eager to know something about Islam. And this was really one of the triumphant moments I had in my da'wah. In the same year, uh, President Sadat went to Jerusalem, and uh, I was invited to one of the American universities uh, in Texas to give a talk about the Palestinian issue. And uh, then the Arabs really divided. Some of the Arabs were for his visit, and some were against his visit. And of course, uh, this differences in points of view caused the lecture to be a complete failure because even the Arabs could not agree about the issue. A Sadat visiting Jerusalem is uh, a clear confession uh, that the Jews have got the right to occupy this land, which uh, does not belong to them legally or uh, racially or uh, religiously or uh, according to anything linguistically this is a, a foreign body that has been implanted in the region by uh, an international plot in revenge of the crusade uh, defeat in jerusalem so it was a bad show and this was probably one of the, of the failures i i received now yeah. so this was in america and now we're in india and i'm sure you have traveled to many places throughout the world what is your favorite place that you have traveled to and where you found that there was a strong Muslim community? You felt like you were at home there. Wallahi, I have traveled to many places that can make you feel that you are at home. Definitely Mecca and Medina would come first. And uh, Malaysia, for example, I feel very comfortable there. Uh, Indonesia, I feel very comfortable there. Pakistan, Bangladesh. Alhamdulillah, I traveled a lot, and uh, I find that Islam is spreading, uh, despite the fact that Muslims are uh, not at their best uh, these days. I was in Japan uh, a few months back, and I lectured in seven different universities, 
And uh, I found that the Japanese people are extremely interested to know about Islam. And if Muslim scholars are aware of this, they should concentrate on countries like Japan, China, India, where there are masses of people who either have no religion or have a corrupt belief. And uh, it's our responsibility in front of Allah to give those people Islam in a wise, uh, kind, uh, gentle, tender way, because the main rule of the Quran is the la ikraha fi din. There should never ever be any compulsion in religion. But this does not defy us from presenting what we have in a brotherly attitude, in a very wise and kind and tender way. It is now time for a short break. So join us in a few minutes, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I am Abdul Bari Yahya, wishing all the viewers of Peace TV a blessed Eid al Abha. of the return. Al-Razzaq, the provider. Al-Waqeeq, the all-watchful. Walillahi al-Asma'u al-Husna, to Allah belongs the beautiful name. Ad'uhu biha, to call him upon them to understand more of Allah's beautiful names join me your brother Majid Mahmoud on my new series about understanding Allah's beautiful names on peace TV the chance to comprehend the seamless explanation of Allah's beautiful names in understanding Allah's beautiful names every Friday at 8 p.m. Saudi Arabia and 9 p.m. UAE on Peace TV. Islam, the religion of natural instinct. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not forbid anything from human beings unless it's hurting them. Be the Muslim who lives between al hawf and Raya. Be the one who lives between fear of the hellfire and lives with the hope of Jannah. We should do our best to show the most affection and love for our children and for children in general. Do not argue with the people of the book, except in ways that are best. Oh believers, why are you saying things that you don't do? It is most hated in the sight of Allah that you say something that you don't do. A believer would know, and a believer would inspire you and encourage you and inform you that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is awesome. Know the only path to salvation. Watch the spirit of Islam. Every Monday at 4 p.m. Saudi Arabia and 5 p.m. UAE on PTV. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome back to the show with me, your host, and Sheikh and Professor Najjar. What is your most, the most hard moment you faced in your years of giving dawah? That moment that you know you use. Allah, I recall in 1990, the Americans came to Saudi Arabia to solve the Kuwaiti Iraqi problem. And at that time, I was teaching at the University of Petroleum and Minerals in Bahrain. 
the Americans came and were established in the airport, the Iran airport, which was only separated from the university by a barbed wire. So we had to see them. And uh, sadly enough, uh, some of uh, those officers, high-ranking officers, came with, with a very arrogant attitude. And uh, I used to hear them saying, this country that forbids the construction of churches, that uh, stops the action of uh, Christian missionaries, and uh, that does not allow women to go out semi-dressed, as is the case in, in the West. We have to compel this country to do what we want. And the soldier came to me in great anger. What can we do? I told them, what can you do? These uh, people came with the permission of your own government. Any reaction against them will put you under the law. They said, we can force them to the narrowest part of the street. And I told them they are uh, driving military cars that can crush your civil cars in no time. They said, are we going just to look at them and uh, do nothing? I said, no, you can do something. They said, what can we do? I said, give them Islam. I'll go and ask them if they would like to listen to some lectures about the culture of this country. You see, in their, their very, very early days, they were not comfortable with what, the way they were staying because they had no recreation facilities at all, which they are used to use. So they welcomed us going lecturing to them. And believe it or not, uh, there was not a single lecture given to them without somebody standing up accepting Islam in front of their leadership, in front of their intelligence, individuals. And they really, every one of them who would uh, embrace Islam would say, what's wrong uh, with you Muslims? Why didn't you come earlier to give us Islam? Why should us uh, be so late in knowing Islam just because you were lazy, not coming and offering? them to us. What's the wrong of my parents without knowing Islam because you were too lazy to come and give it to us and so on. Within three months, more than 20,000 men and women embraced Islam, from major generals to ordinary soldiers, from men and women, from blacks and whites. And it was really a challenge. And uh, I traveled to the United States to link those Muslims because we had their addresses and their telephone numbers and their full names to link them with Islamic centers in the United States. And wallahi, I was asked to give khutbah Friday in a mosque called Darul Hijra in Washington, D.C. And on the pulpit, I saw a major general from the Marines. And never had a doubt this man was in the Gulf region. But after the Salah, he came to me, he shook hands with me and I asked him, have you been to the Gulf region? He said, no, my son was there and they brought Islam to us. These are some of the memories which we had. Well, of course, we had lots of debates and lots of discussions, political, uh, economic, uh, social, and, and the like. This, the dawah, the mission of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa this was his mission. Yes. How can we improve our, on our dawah skills and how can we also teach Islam through a scientific perspective? You see, many people think that there is no link between the Quran and science or the sayings of the Prophet, peace be upon him, and science. Because uh, they believe that science is an innovation that has nothing to do with Quran and Sunnah. Uh, but uh, really, if we agree that the Quran is the divine word in its divine purity, is the word of the Creator, its divine nature, we have to accept the fact that any scientific notion in the Quran is absolutely correct. And if we can prove that, we can use the correct scientific notions in Quran as a way of dawah to the people of our time in the language they can understand, the only language they can understand. So many people think that Quran is a book of guidance to man in areas that cannot be clearly addressed by man, such as the area of faith, the area of the moral code, the area of the code of transactions with others. And they say how science can come in Actually, when I looked into the Quran, I found that there are more than 1,000 cosmic verses in the Quran. And I found that these cosmic verses did not come down to us as pieces of scientific information per se. They come in the context of testifying to the might, knowledge, and wisdom of the Creator. To the fact that who has created is capable of annihilating his creation. 
and capable of resurrecting it once more. And the area of resurrection has been highly debated by atheists and agnostics throughout human history. And I could see clearly that these cosmic verses also came down as an address to the people of our time. Because Allah knows in his eternal knowledge that time will come when man discovers lots of these scientific facts. So the, the notion in the Quran and in the sayings of Muhammad, peace be upon him, can be a good way of addressing people of this era of science and technology. What is the, the value of these notions? Because many people, they come with the argument and say, the Quran is a religious book. We shouldn't mix the two, Quran and science. But You see, some people think that science is basically hypotheses and theories that are liable to change. And they say, how come that you face the word of uh, the creator to uh, the, the word of man? And the word of man is liable to change. Actually, many people think that uh, science is mainly established on the basis of a large number of hypotheses and theories. And hypotheses and theories are liable to change. But in fact, science can reach absolute facts. These facts may be added to, may be expanded, but they are never reversed. You see, I, once you reach a fact, uh, a law, or a correct mathematical formula, you don't go back against what you have reached. So uh, one of the basic uh, rules in uh, dealing with the scientific notions in the Quran is that we can only use absolute facts. You use a theory or a hypothesis. We only use absolute facts, except in areas of creation, which are not subject to experimentation. Uh, I cannot really go and carry out an experiment to see how the universe was created or how life was created or how man was created. So in this area, we are bound to find many theories uh, because acquired knowledge cannot be an absolute fact in these three areas, creation of the universe, creation of life, creation of man. So with this multitude of theories, we can find a notion in the Quran or in the Sunnah that can help the Muslim, the Muslim alone, to raise one of these theories to the status of being a fact. Not because science has reached that level in it, but because there is a mention about it in the Quran or in Sunnah. So the, the Christians and the Jews, they also claim they have miracles in their books and the Quran is, is not the only book with miracles. So how, what do we say to this argument? A very good question. And there is a great difference between the divine word and the human word. So these books are full of linguistic mistakes, of historic mistakes, of scientific mistakes, of moral mistakes, uh, full of mistakes. And of course, referring them to the Creator is a great blasphemy that should not be accepted. Nevertheless, they are established on the basis of a previous revelation in which you believe which was absolutely correct. So if it happens that there is something correct in these books, it's a remnant of that initial truth that was revealed to these prophets in the past. Many Muslims, they may read the Quran and may read the scientific miracles in the Quran, but they may read a hadith or a verse, which of course the Quran is revealed from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When they hear the verse, they may have doubts in their head and they may reject it. How can we in our hearts, this yaqeen, this certainty that this revelation is because from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. See, Islam is a religion that cannot be based on inheritance alone or on ignorance. It's a religion that has to be established on the basis of knowledge and commitment. It will not be enough to say I'm a Muslim because I was born in a Muslim family. You see, once you reach the age of reason, Every Muslim, man or woman, is asked to read the Quran and read the Sunnah of the Prophet, peace be upon him, and his biography, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, very critically, very critically, and ask as many questions as he or she can ask. Because this is the only way by which knowledge can be gained. But uh, it will not be enough, uh, really, uh, for me uh, to say I, I was born in a Muslim family and I am a Muslim. It's not enough. Because Islam is a religion that has to be established on the basis of knowledge and commitment. And I recall some of the companions of the Prophet, peace be upon him, 
Yusuf said we never exceeded 10 verses until we understood what's in them in the form of instruction and uh, to do or not to do. And we committed ourselves to this guidance. And they used to say, In that way, we have gained knowledge and the commitment in one go. So that this is a Muslim. A Muslim should not be a true Muslim if he is ignorant of Islam or if he just follows the practice of his parents يعني, without criticizing his faith, without criticizing his knowledge, without increasing that knowledge steadily from the age of reason until the end of his life. Jazakallah for the pearls of wisdom you are sharing with us. Inshallah, we will all benefit from it. Um, we've come to an end for this episode. Join us for the next one, Inshallah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Spread the word. At the time of Nuh, peace be upon him, the floods swept the entire earth, sparing only those who believed. Today, floods of shirk, floods of innovation, and floods of desires and lust are sweeping the whole earth. Imam Malik ibn Anas of Medina said that the Sunnah is the Ark of Nuh. Whoever bought it is saved, and whoever refuses is drowned and is doomed forever. Join me in Al Arba'in al Nawawiyya, the 40 hadith compiled by Imam al Nawawi. Join Asim al Hakim in Al Arba'in al Nawawiyya every Tuesday at 11.30 p.m. Saudi Arabia and 12 a.m. UAE on Peace TV. for humanity.